Our final speaker this afternoon is distinguished Professor Peter Cook. Peter Cook is a Professor of Robotic Vision at Queensland University of Technology and Director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Robotic Vision. I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Peter to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm a roboticist, I'm not a medical doctor, and I'd like to talk about AI and robotics. Uh, I'd like to give you my perspective on these terms, unpack what they mean, perhaps disabuse you of some preconceptions you have about what robots are, what AI is. Preconceptions you've probably got too about what these technologies are and what they're not. I think in general people have an overinflated sense of what these technologies are capable of. I, as uh, Nick mentioned, I'm director of a Centre for Robotic Vision, and i just talk briefly what that's about. We believe in the future that robots are going to be an important part of society. We want robots to be working with us in our homes, in our hospitals, in our offices. And if they're going to do that in any kind of intelligent way, they need to understand what's going on around them. The way we've evolved to understand what's going on around them is a phenomenal visual system. We've evolved a very complex, very sophisticated system that lets me see from here out to the horizon, recognize objects, predict what things are going to do in the future. It's been really, really powerful for our survival as a, as a species. And so our belief is that if robots are going to be anything like as competent as human beings, they've got to be able to see. So my center is about how do we imbue robots with a sense of vision. So let's talk about robots. What are robots? Are they a force for good, a force of evil? Are they going to be uh, salvation of humanity? Are they going to help humanity? Or are they going to wipe humanity out? We are deeply conflicted about robots. And one of the reasons I think we're so conflicted about robots is that our minds have been messed with by the creators of fiction. Almost everything that you know about robots, you've probably gotten from fiction. So the word robot is a word from fiction. It's a Czech word. It was first coined in a play in 1920, uh, and it means effectively serf labor. Uh, it's got notions of slavery, enforced labor about it. And what's interesting about this first play from 1920 is it's about human beings creating robots to do menial, drudge, physical work, which human beings don't like to do. And the robots eventually get sick of doing this, and they rise up, they rebel, and they kill the human beings. So you've seen this movie, right? Lots and lots of times with different titles and different actors. Right? It was first happened in 1920 in an obscure Czech play. So most of what we know about robots comes from fiction. And there's a ton of fiction. Right, movies from a long, long time ago, more recent movies, lots and lots of fiction. It's worked its way into your minds, and it's colored uh, what, how you react when you hear the word robot. Uh, these guys, probably very famous robots, right? You get the impression that they're super intelligent machines, can speak thousands of languages, uh, though slightly obnoxious, or the little guy, the little one that beeps. Right? A phenomenal engineer, he can hack a Death Star, he can fix an X-wing fighter. Right? These are the images that we get from science fiction movies. This movie, some of you might have seen, Robot and Frank. We have robots that are both charming and empathetic. Lovely image for a robot. You can always imagine that in the near-term future, robots looking after us in our dotage. The problem with all of these images, it's fiction. So, Star Wars robots men in metal suits, right? And the lovely robot from Robot and Frank's a lady in a robot suit, right? The reason those robots look intelligent, act intelligently, is because they've got intelligent human beings inside the suit, right? We cannot make machines like that yet. As a roboticist, these robots are, are both, a, I guess, an aspirational goal, a beacon on the hill, that's what we want to create. But they're also a curse because whenever we create a robot, a little seven-year-old kid will come along and say, that's not a robot. I know what robots are. I've seen them in the movies. The thing you've created, spent years slaving to create, it's not a robot. Little kids know best. 
Robots at work today are pretty prosaic. Uh, they create a lot of value for the economy. The one on the left-hand side is building Tesla motor cars. Uh, this is a very mature technology, 60-year-old technology, robots at work in manufacturing. These robots are blind, uh, yet they're incredibly precise, incredibly reliable, work 24 by 7 and don't complain. What you see on the right-hand side is an Amazon fulfillment center. The little orange things are robots. They go around, they pick up shelves uh, that contain the sort of product that you order from Amazon, and they bring it to a human being who reaches into the shelf and takes out the item that you want and put it into the cardboard box that's delivered to your house. There are no human beings walking around the Amazon warehouse. In tens of millions of products, the warehouse would just be huge, and it would take too long to fill your cardboard box. Humans stand still. The shelves are brought to the humans by robots. Amazon has over 100,000 robots in their business. Amazon is essentially a robotics and IT company uh, that delivers uh, products to your house. It's kind of a side effect of a massive IT and robotics infrastructure uh, that they've spent a lot of time developing. And here you can see the human being uh, tending the robots, taking the things out of the shelf and putting them in the box. You say, why is the human being doing that? Why isn't a robot doing that? And that is actually not possible for a robot to do that. Robots at the moment are not capable of reaching into a shelf, recognizing a jumble of objects, the particular thing, and taking it out. Two problems, actually. They don't have the perceptual capability to do that, and nor do they have this thing. The manipulators, the hands that robots have today, are still really, really crude. They don't have the dexterity uh, that the human hand does. They don't have the tactile perception that a human hand does. Uh, so you think about robots, and you get the science fiction image, and I'm saying a robot can't reach into a box and take out a toothbrush. That's the reality today. We've spent a lot of time trying to make robots that look like humans, little cute ones there, and the one on the, on the left-hand side is uh, a European academic uh, who's cloned himself, uh, and he's probably, this is pretty clunky, it's pretty easy to tell which one's the robot. We can do better than that now. It's another one, uh, the first speaker mentioned uh, about this. This is an early example of uh, the humanoid robot from uh, Boston Dynamics, I think this is maybe 12 months old. Uh, again, gives you an idea what the state of the art is. This is an intelligent system. All of the perception, it's understanding the world, not through eyes, a little spinny thing on its head, uh, but it's got a sense of balance, it can model the terrain, it's got a goal, it can figure out what to do. Something goes wrong, it can recover. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, and more recently, it can do backflips and jump from one box to another. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of state-of-the-art in humanoid robotic capability. You can see here it's uh, recovering quite nicely, uh, even as its foot sinks into, into the snow. So this is, uh, this is a robotic system and, and pretty, pretty intelligent. Uh, the field of AI is really all about, is about algorithms. It's about, thing, it's about manipulating information. And we've seen huge progress in AI. Uh, from a field that was probably first created late 50s, early 60s. Uh, in 1997, AI systems beat human grandmasters. So AI systems rule at chess for uh, 20 years. And just a couple of years ago, uh, we beat human beings at another game, another board game, the uh, Asian game of Go, uh, which is much, much more complicated than the game of chess. So in these games, uh, which is something we typically associate with human intelligence and human creativity in order to be able to play these games, we are whipped by artificial intelligence systems, which can look ahead into the future, evaluate lots of possibilities, uh, as well as incorporate lots of, lots of playbooks. Everything that a human being has ever done, all the moves, uh, can be ingested by, by the AI and used. Some of the other things that AIs can do, and again, this is, uh, this is not uh, particularly recent results, we can put in a picture and get a caption uh, in some ways. You can't say that the machine is understanding what's going on in the picture, but it is associating word labels with what's in the picture, which is quite an advance. So you look at the things here, young girl in a pink shirt is swinging on swing. That's not bad, right? Put in a picture and you get out a crisp, wordy description of what's going on in the scene. Google Photos now have rolled out something like this. It's in production, so I can go to my Google Photo albums and put in the word ships. Here's all the photos in my photo album with ships. I like ships. There's lots of pictures of ships in my photo album. Uh, and it will pull out all the pictures of ships, or I could time dogs or beaches or sunsets. 
it will pull out those. So we're starting to combine the ability to understand human written natural language and associate it with images. Uh, so this is quite powerful sort of capability that AI can demonstrate. Natural, natural language uh, understanding and processing, things like Alexa, uh, the Google microphone thing, the Apple microphone thing, this is now a commodity tech. Siri uh, in your phone, OK Google, right? We can speak to our devices, and the repertoire is still kind of limited, but the progress has been phenomenal. And this is all that AI can do. Short articles now are written by AIs, uh, short sports pieces, short financial pieces. It ingests the data, uh, turns it into sentences, and uh, puts it out on the wire. So lots of stuff you read has been written by a machine, hasn't been written by human beings. All of this is underpinned by something Moore's Law, and I'm going to labor this point a little bit. I'm sure everyone in the room's heard of Moore's Law. I uh, just want to unpack what it is. This guy Gordon Moore, back in 1965, he's an engineer at Fairchild Semiconductor, and he plotted this graph about the number of transistors that they could put on a chip. And this is a graph with like only four data points. This is where Moore's Law comes from, it's from four data points. And he extrapolated a little bit forward, extrapolated forward 10 years, and sort of saw that there was this doubling of the number of transistors on a chip every 18 months. The article that he pub the journal that he published this in was a kind of geeky tech, uh, tech magazine, and they mocked him. There was a cartoon next to the article in the middle, in the middle panel there, there somebody holding up this nonsensical thing, a home computer that you could hold in your hand. Because in 1965, a computer filled the room. Everybody knew that. So he was mocked uh, in this original piece. Anyway, a little time later, he went and formed a little company called Intel. Uh, that's Gordon there. Intel when it had 100 employees, and it's grown and grown. The graph kept on going. Uh, and people keep writing articles about when Moore's Law will finish. Uh, but it's, uh, its demise has been predicted a lot, and it's still cranking on. And to give you an impression about the power of this doubling, this relentless doubling every 18 months, analogies often given to grains of rice on a chessboard. Right? Every, every next square, you put double the number of grains of rice than the square before. This square up here, uh, it's huge. A thousand times more rice than we produce on planet Earth in a year. Right? Massive. Where's Moore's Law up to? 36 doublings so far. So you imagine the pile of rice on square number 36. Doublings are very, very powerful. Uh, very little else in the world does this, this, this doubling thing. Uh, and that's what's powering AI. That's what's powering our ability to understand pictures, understand sentences. It's from Moore's law is what underpins it. It's the fuel. Crazy guy called Ray Kurzweil. Uh, he's a thinker and, uh, and a crazy guy. And he plots this graph. And it's about the amount of computing you can get for 1,000 bucks. And where we are now, coming up to 2020, for 1,000 bucks, maybe you get enough computer to emulate the brain of a mouse. Not sure if this is true. Uh, there are people trying to simulate brains of, uh, of small animals. But here's the thing. By 2025, 2026, for 1,000 bucks, enough computing for a human brain. By 2050, for 1,000 bucks, enough computing for all of humanity. That is profound. If you think what you can do with that much computing, uh, we move into a regime that humanity has never, ever been in before. Uh, very, very exciting times, all underpinned by, by Moore's law. So you see lots of articles about uh, the problems of AI, people writing about the dangers of AI, the dangers of robotics. People tend to confuse these two things. For me, AI is all about systems that manipulate information, manipulate pictures, voice waveforms, uh, natural language works in the virtual world. It pushes information around. A robot is an AI that's embodied in the physical world. It's an AI in a machine that can move around, pick things up, move stuff around. It's an AI with physical agency. That's the difference. There's a wonderful thing called Moravec's paradox. Moravec, Hans Moravec is another, another really big thinker uh, in the robotics area. And here's the thing, the game of chess quite easy for machines to do these days, and quite a hard thing for humans to do. I'm not a particularly strong chess player. 
that machines can beat any human being at the game of chess. Yet, if you wanted to pick up a chess piece on a board, the kid there could do that way better than a robot can do at the moment. And that's for those, the reason for that is the two limitations of robotic technology I mentioned before. Robots at the moment have got rubbish eyesight and they don't have very good manipulation capability. So a robot would struggle to recognize the chess pieces and it would struggle to reach in and delicately pick one of them up and not knock the other ones over. That's still cutting edge robotics research. So when you worry about Terminator type robots taking over the planet, uh, that's one sort of data point we have and the other is a robot can't pick up a chess piece, right? That's the current reality. And we're making progress, but it's slow progress. So another, couple, another definition I want to put into your heads, we have th we might, things we might call autonomous robots. And that's an AI with legs or arms or something like that. It's AI embodied in a machine that can do stuff. And then we have tele-robots. And that's a human robot combination. So robotic surgery, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, the intuitive surgical da Vinci machines, it's a human surgeon making actions uh, through little joysticks and the robot is carrying out those actions. So it's not, an it's not an AI in charge here, it's a human being in charge here. And maybe the AI can provide some assistance, stop the surgeon making a mistake, remove tremor, and things like that. But it's the human in charge assisted by a machine. It's an important distinction. All right, so uh, I'm going to go really quickly through this. Many people talk about us now being in what's called the fourth industrial revolution. And this is about machines gaining intelligence. Before, it was all about muscle power. Uh, we used water and steam, and then electricity. Computers came along. But now we've kind of done a phase change. We're now into an era of intelligence and intelligent machines. What are the implications for healthcare? I'm going to speculate a little bit here. Uh, let's uh, put some things out there. Image interpretation. And I know that's not physician business. This is the thing that's going to be the most easy to automate. AIs will eat this task. And they'll certainly do a lot of screening and hand the curly ones across to people to look at. But I think this is something that's very, very easily automatable. Diagnosis, which is your business, uh, I think also uh, is highly automatable by, by AI systems, particularly uh, augmented by the sort of amazing diagnostics that will come from genomics uh, and, and medical, med medical imagery. Telemedicine, uh, I guess it's, got, it's related to, uh, to diagnosis, but I think this is a pretty easy technology, actually. There's not much in it. There's not really AI. It's just uh, it's Skype, on, Skype on wheels. Uh, I'm surprised it doesn't have uh, the sort of impact or penetration, uh, particularly in a country like this, which has got a, such a sparse population. And maybe that's because we're waiting for the NBN. I don't know why we don't have telemedicine. Uh, Hospital services, uh, I think these are already starting to be seen. Uh, robots that tote material around hospitals, uh, specimens, uh, drugs, meals, linen, right? It's gonna be toted around by robots. Robots might replace the work of orderlies in lifting people in and out of beds, helping them with toilets, helping them in showers, and even inst medical instruments that can automatically move around the hospital without having to be pushed. Uh, also, there are prototypes uh, in the world. Procedures. Surgery, well addressed by robotics, this tele-robotics. I'm not sure what's happening in terms of endoscopy. I know there's been work on simulators, virtual reality simulators for colonoscopy. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's automatable here in terms of uh, different, different types of uh, scoping procedures. And care in all its forms, I think we will see robots doing this. Young people, old people, uh, and so on. I'm going to talk really quickly about this. Who's seen this headline, my 20, 30, 47% of jobs are going to be obsolete? Yeah, it's been in the headlines a lot. It's very annoying. Uh, it was a study that came out in 2013, uh, and it conjures up horrible images of soup lines and, and so on. The guys have, have kind of recanted quite a bit and uh, said to some extent they really don't know, uh, which is somewhat encouraging, I guess. Uh, and they've sort of considered the fact that as, we, as the world changes, we have climate change and demographic shift, actually there might be whole new sorts of jobs that are required that really weren't taken into account in that old study, which looked at existing jobs and looked at how they could be automated. And many of them will, new jobs will come. So the future is perhaps a bit more, a bit more optimistic. So 
Uh, there's some books and no particular recommendations, uh, but some interesting reading on perhaps what automation, AI, robotics uh, means, for, uh, means for us all. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.